Amen. So we're there in uh, Genesis 7, and we're going to be there at the, in chapter, I mean 7, verse 5. We're there in Genesis 7, in verse 5, and the Bible reads, And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him, and Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in, and his sons and his wives and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. And the title of the sermon this evening, or this afternoon, is the floods will come. The floods will come. And uh, the reason I'm preaching this is obviously a couple of weeks ago, we had a couple of floods here in Houston. As a matter of fact, I've lived in Houston uh, on and off since 2005. But in the last couple of years, um, my wife and I moved into the complex we live in now in 2013. And right around 2015, we got the May floods. And then in 2016, we got the May floods again. And then I think 2017 was Harvey. Then 2018, we just had light, light floods. And then this last year, this year, 2019, we had floods again around the same time. But what was interesting to us is every year the, flood it has, the flooding has been different. Um, and it's affected different areas, of course, the most famous being uh, Hurricane Harvey. But up to this point, we had not been affected other than the inconvenience of the floods in the city. But... Uh, for some reason, the area where we live in had never really flooded so high, but we just had a flash flood uh, just a couple of weeks ago when Tropical Storm Imelda came, and one of our cars got flooded. It didn't get totaled because the water just went in on the uh, the floorboards and the uh, just under the seats. And luckily, you know, with the the insurance system we have today, we filed our claim, and the car is getting fixed. We've been without a car for a couple of weeks, but it just it's just a good in season message. Uh, to go over the flood and just the things that God uh, has promised, the things that we see, why are these things happening? Why do we have natural disasters? Why do they seem to be increasing? Uh, just different things that we want to. And then we're going to get a, a practical application and a spiritual application of, of the flood. And so before we go into the points real quick, I mean, uh, you see in Genesis 5, we get the Adam's descendants and we, we see the, the introduction of Noah. And then in verse 6, we immediately see, I mean, in chapter 6 of verse 1, and we're not going to go through the whole story. I'm going to give you the quick synopsis so we can get to the points. But in chapter 6, we see in verse 1, it says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the daughters were born unto, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw that the, daughter, the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives, all of which they chose, and then you see this, this uh, explanation of the daughters and the sons of God and how they're constantly doing wickedly. And then you go down uh, to verse 6, and it says, And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the earth. For it repenteth me that I have made them. And real quick, before we even get to a point, just... Obviously, there's a false doctrine out there that says that you have to repent of your sins to be saved. And we see that that would be not only is it false because you don't see that uh, the, that phrase anywhere in the Bible, but because God is not someone to repent of anything so that he can save. He is the savior of the world. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, so that we could be saved. And God, all he did here is change his mind. He's saying, look, I changed my mind that I made man on the earth and it grieved me or it grieved him at his heart. And then we see later on in verse 11, we continue seeing a more, uh, uh, what well, verse 8 says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And it gives us the generations. And then verse 11 says, And the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his ways upon the earth. So we know that even uh, those that of the lineage of, of Noah which is the lineage of Adam, those that have been uh, uh, have received the Lord, those are saved because they, they're later mentioned in the New Testament, they've corrupted their ways. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And so this is the reason why God is deciding to destroy the earth. Then he instructs Noah to build an ark. And then he and not only does he build the ark, but he tells him that there's going to be a flood, and this is where... We get the, the, the verses for today. And so there's a couple of things that just really stand out. And that's really what I'm going to focus on. Uh, for the sake of time, I mean, just going through the entire uh, 
uh, <coughs> flood account would probably it's probably a and you know what it's going to be a, a series of sermons because I think there's a lot to cover in those uh, four or five chapters of, of Genesis. But for this message, just because of what happened and the things that that uh, you know I've experienced from others and we experienced ourselves, I, I really wanted to bring a spiritual application. And so the very first thing we see is we have a promise that God will never flood the earth again. But that didn't mean that there wasn't a promise that their floods wouldn't come. You know, there's a big difference between flooding the earth and floods just, just occurring. We see flood accounts even now throughout history. I mean, obviously here in Houston, we've experienced a lot of flooding lately. And it's caused a lot of damage and it ca it's caused a lot of things. So, you know, we are going to experience these things, but we're not going to ever see a full flood. And why do I say that? Well, it's also important because recently, as in the last few weeks, we've had even just a, a young uh, lady by the name, I think, of Greta, and through the United Nations have made this push where in the next couple of years, in the next, they say we only have 12 to 14 years of the earth to live. And in Genesis 8, we actually see that that's not true. That, you know, this, this satanic fear mongering to protect Mother Nature, which is a false uh, idol, because nature comes from God, is, is the thing that uh, we have to be. Con and they're like, look, the icebergs are gonna, they're gonna melt, and the whole world's gonna melt. Well, look, if you listen to the Bible, if you read the Bible, you know that this is not true. As a matter of fact, this is not part of my sermon, but in Genesis eight verse twenty-two, the Bible says, "While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat." and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. So the Bible's telling us that nothing's going to cease until God says it's going to cease. He's the one that caused the earth to flood. He's the one that's going to cause it not to flood. He gave us a promise in the rainbow. But I, I, let me not get off on tangent, but we have a promise that God will never flood the earth again. And we also see this in other verses, but we have a promise because of the righteous, because of the remnant. Let's go there to Isaiah 54. Go to Isaiah 54. Um, actually, I'll read Isaiah 54. Why don't you go to Ezekiel 14? Go to Ezekiel 14. Ezekiel 14, and I'll read Isaiah 54 for you. And in verse 9 says, For this is the waters of Noah unto me, for as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord, that hath mercy on thee. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not com comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, and lay thy foundations with sapphire, and I will make thy windows of a gate, and thy gate of car carbon uh, carbuncles, and all thy borders of pleasant stones, and all thy children should be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. In righteousness shall thou be established. Thou shalt be far from the oppression, for thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. Behold, they shall surely gather together, but <clears throat> not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire, and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the waster to destroy. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteous is of me, saith the Lord. So we see here, and of course, I mean, we're not doing a study in Isaiah. That Isaiah is a book of prophecies, but part of this is that God is telling us there is no weapon formed against us that will prosper, and there is nothing that, and he's not going to destroy us. We go back to Isaiah 54, 14 because of, of the flood. He made that promise, and it's because of the righteous. You know, if you look uh, in Genesis, you see Abraham makes a plea for the people and uh, for Sodom and Gomorrah. You see that Moses, after the golden calf, makes a plea. And, and you see that there's always a small remnant. You see uh, the story of Job, and he was righteous and upright and sheweth evil. You see these things that that uh, cause, I mean, God cares even about one soul. You know, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is there's a promise that he's not going to flood the world because he's going to do it in his, he's going to cleanse the world at his time. But for us, that promise should be important in the sense that we should not fear what the world tells us is a natural disaster or the things that could cause us to die. 
what we should do is focus on the task at hand. If there's a promise that these things, there's no weapon formed against us that'll prosper, then what we should do is focus on the main thing. The main thing being the soul winning, being the baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, being that we're going to go out there and we're going to disciple others, that, that we're going to walk a righteous uh, path, that we're going to raise our, our families in the fear and the admonition of the Lord, that we're going to separate ourselves from the sin of the world. You know, the, everybody's so up in arms, even, and, and they said it was a hoax, but even at a hoax, and I, I actually saw the clip uh, that, uh, I forget that Congress movement, because uh, she now has an acronym, AOC, so something Cortez, Angela Cortez, I don't remember, the one in New York that's really dumb. She was having a town hall meeting, and um, I guess somebody got up and said that the world's going to end in months. And they were making this plea to her to, you know, that they need to change the laws. And she was wearing a shirt that said, you have to eat, we have to start eating babies. Now, whether it's a hoax or not, the fact that we're even having that discussion shows how satanic and evil this uh, environmentalist movement is, this movement of being green and saving the earth and the community. Look, the only thing we have to do, like the Bible says, is to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And if we actually raise individuals and we, we change people's lives by giving them the gospel of Jesus Christ and saving them and then discipling them, we wouldn't have to worry about all the junk and all the things that they do. I mean, have you ever noticed when you go into the poor communities, we just got back from Soul Winning, we went to this really poor neighborhood, uh, apartment complex, and the reason people are dirty is just that they, they, uh, they're not educated. But they're not educated on the right things. If you read the Bible, the Bible t teaches us to be clean, to be separate. Yeah, I, you don't have to have common sense and, and uh, a bunch of degrees and PhDs to know that if God says to be clean, then you're just going to be clean because you want to obey God. You don't have to have the environmentalists tell you that, uh, you know, plastics goes in the plastics bin and papers go in the paper bin and trash and, and make a, a mess of it. You just have to read God's word and you'll start doing things naturally. You know, if you look at anybody who's actually walking in the spirit, what they'll do is they actually start improving their lives and they're moving more towards the righteous life. They're never going to be perfect on this earth, but they're moving that way. Now go to, you're there in Ezekiel 14, let's just keep reading. And the Bible, you know, this promise is, is evident even through some of the Old Testament and, and the New Testament. And I got a lot of scripture to cover, so today, you know, we, we're going to move a little bit fast, but I want to make sure we cover these points. The Ezekiel 14, 12 says, The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by the trespassing grievously, then I will stretch out my hand upon it, and will break the staff of the bread thereof, and will send famine upon it, and will cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by the righteousness, saith the Lord God. And the reason this stood out to me is for, for a couple of reasons, he, and, we're, and I'll close it out, but it's interesting that God said, look, all this is going on, and if it's going on, only Noah, Daniel, and Job, if they were in it, and if they were righteous, they would only deliver themselves, meaning there's only one Savior. You know, people want to lean on others' understanding or their works or the church they go to, or the person they tie to. The Bible says you tie to the Lord. It says, if, if I cause noise and beasts to pass through the land and they spoil it, so that it be desolate that no man may pass through, the, through because of the beast, though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters. They only shall deliver, be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. Or if I bring a sword upon that land and say, sword, go through the land, so I cut off man and beast from it, Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughters, but they only shall be delivered themselves. Or if I send pestilence into the land and pour out my fury upon it in blood to cut off from uh, it man and beast, though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. For thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my four judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword and the famine and the noisome beast and the pestilence to, to cut off from man, from it man and beast. Yet behold, therein shall be left a remnant that shall be brought forth, both sons and daughters. Behold, they shall come forth unto you and ye shall see their way and their doings and ye shall be comforted concerning the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem, even concerning all that I have brought upon it, 
and they shall comfort you when ye see their ways and their doings, and ye shall know that I have not done without cause all that I have done in it, saith the Lord. And we see here an example, and, and like I said, none of these, I'm using these, uh, we see here an example of the Lord talking about four pestilence he would bring to the earth, but that because of a remnant, others will learn from them. So it's not that it's going to stop the things that God's going to do, but there will always be, he's not going to totally destroy everything anymore because of a remnant. He says, yet behold, therein shall be a left a remnant that shall be brought forth, both sons and daughters. Behold, they shall come forth unto you, and you shall see their way and their doings, and you shall be comforted concerning the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem. And, <clears throat> and it's interesting that as he, he's talking about that remnant, before he's mentioning that if there was a remnant, such as Daniel and Noah and Job, only those would be saved. <laughs> through their righteousness and then he gives us this example of how the remnant is there behold they shall come forth unto you and you shall see their way and their doings and you shall be comforted concerning the evil that i have brought upon jerusalem even concerning all that i have brought upon it and obviously i'm giving you the spiritual obligation that we should be the example to the world and we should show forth our courage you know i mean everybody wants to i mean i was i'm not going to lie that i even did a, a facebook live video uh, I was nervous of the water creeping into the home and I was just thinking about how uncomfortable it would be and we'd have to find a place to live for a couple of weeks and you know it's been a little bit of an inconvenience not having that second car and uh, but the thing that that uh, I did say and I meant that is that we don't have anything to fear through those things because we know that God's going to take care of us and we should be an example to others of how to deal with these situations you know floods pestilence you know, beast, all these things, they will come. You know, I, I, it's not a coincidence that all of this is increasing. The Bible warns us of this. You know, I mean, I, I just chose to speak on floods because that's what happened recently. But, you know, there's droughts. I remember growing up in the valley, in, in the Rio Grande Valley down on the south border. And there was a couple of years there when we went to a drought and they told us that, you know, how, what days you could use, you know, the hoses and water the plants and all that. I mean, these things have been occurring ever since I was a little kid. But uh, go over to 1 Peter 3, and I'll read for you real quick Hebrews 11.6. It says in Hebrews 11.6, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heirs of the righteousness which is by faith. And we, we see the reason I'm focusing on Noah is because he was the one that experienced this, and he also was the one that had the covenant revealed to him of the rainbow that this would never happen again. His faith is what pleased God. In 1 Peter 3.20, we see which sometimes were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. The like figure were unto even baptism doth now also save us, not the putting away of filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. I'm going through these verses because you see that this was an important event. And I mean, we could I could have done, you know, um, how the ark only had one door and Jesus is the door. I mean, there's so much that you can do there and, and we'll do that at a later time. But this was such an important event. You see it mentioned again and again not only in the old testament as you move further but you also see it mentioned again and again in the new testament as this promise that we're never going to have this flood again and that what's also the promise is the promise is that no matter what there's no weapon formed against us that uh, uh what is it no form no weapon formed against the there's no weapon formed against us that shall prosper sorry about that and then uh if you're there uh go to second uh, go to second peter 2 Wow, I hit that pretty, that paper made it pretty loud. But in 2 Peter 2, we see in uh, verse 1, it says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false prophets, false teachers among you, who privily should bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring in upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reasons of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through their covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them, 
into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And spare not the old world, but save Noah, the eighth person, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned with them that overthrow, making an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and deliver just Lot, vexed with filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vex this righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. And the reason we see this is because this is, this is what's going to happen. I mean, even to this day, there's an argument of whether there was a worldwide flood. And then you hear arguments like, well, there's other civilizations or there's other histories that talk of a worldwide flood. So it's not specific to the Bible. But where do you think they got it from? You know, we know that there was already uh, one of his three children went off the beaten path and did some wicked things. Well, if he was serving the devil after, where do you think that, that line, that you know, the Canaanites, you know, they, they ended up in idol worship and doing things of, of that sort. So we see that this, the lies are going to permeate and they're, the lies are coming back again. I mean, they've been telling us that the world's going to freeze or that the world's going to get too hot or that we're going to, you know, we're going to melt the icebergs and everything's going to flood. But let me tell you something. The Bible's, the God's promised us that he's not going to flood the world again. Now, that doesn't mean that he hasn't promised the world's not going to get destroyed. And that leads me to my next point. The next time the earth will de is destroyed, it will not be by water. So there will be a global warming, but it's not what, uh, you know, evolutionists and climate changers think. The Bible is actually very specific about how this is going to come. Go to second, stay there in Second Peter, and just turn over to Second Peter three. But I'm going to be in Matthew, and we have to look at both the positive and the negative of this thing. You know, Noah immediately after, and you don't have to turn there, but in verse, in chapter eight of Genesis, in verse twenty, it says, "And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar." And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. And so, and then shortly after that, in, ver, in, I mean in, uh, in chapter 9, we see the blessing, we see the covenant, we see the rainbow, and then what happens? Noah gets drunk, right, and we see Canaan's curse. We see that, uh, that uh, <clears throat> Noah, in verse 20 of, of, of 9, it says, And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father. So we see that when we're looking at, Eze uh, when we're looking at Isaiah, I mean, uh, Ezekiel, and it's making mention of you know, Daniel and Noah and Job, these righteous people that are saved by their righteousness, it's not by their works. I might as well just throw that in there. And this is actually, I'm on a little rabbit trail, but it's not by their works. It's by their righteousness. It's by the faith. In verse 11 of Hebrews, it says, by faith, with, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And then we see that it talks of Noah. You know, let me just go there. It, it, verse 7, by faith, Noah, being warned of God, of those things not seen as yet move, with fear prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by, which, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is what? By faith. That's actually a real important point because these points I'm making are only true and they're only going to resonate well in your mind if you have the faith to believe that the word of God is true. If you're going to believe the world that says, well, you know, science trumps God, you're not going to then believe what the Bible says. I mean, the Bible says that science comes from God. You know, so it's, it's, it's not this opposing view where the world has to prove, where God has to prove science, it's really that science proves God. And, and, and there's, there's this constant battle against the truth. But the, there is going to be a destruction. But uh, you're there in Second Peter. I'm just going to read for you real quick. Matthew 24, verse 36 says, But of the day and the hour no man no, knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood they were eating for as in the days that were before the flood they were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered in the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away so shall be 
the coming of the Son of Man. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And then in Luke 17, 26, it kind of gives a similar uh, word. And it says, and as it, and as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives that were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus, it shall be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So we see this picture of Noah preparing. And we know that as Noah was preparing, it had never rained. I mean, Noah really went by faith. Imagine, it's even hard for us to imagine a time when there was no rain. I mean, we just saw rain a couple weeks ago. And then we see that Nobody saw it coming. They were just living life. They were going to college. They were getting married. They were having 2.5 kids and a dog and a cat. And, you know, and actually it's worse now. Nobody wants to have children anymore. Now they just want to have dogs and cats and call them their kids. And, you know, you can't talk bad about animals because you're some kind of jerk. I mean, really, I, I have people that I, I'm like, look, your dog is, is dying. And it's, 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 it's. It, it can't control itself, and it's 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 uh, defecating everywhere. You know these people that have these old dogs. I'm like, you, for the sake of humanity, actually, it's more humane to put a dog that has no purpose on this earth to put it to sleep than to just leave that dog there and make yourself uncomfortable. But oh, that's my kid. I have an emotional tie to it. That is nowhere near a child that can change the world, that can go out there and do great things for God. I mean, the Bible tells us that an animal has no soul. But the thing that we see here is we are there where people are just, you know, they're eating and they're, uh, they're eating and drinking, marrying and giving to marriage, it, you know. And then what does it say? And knew not, verse 39, until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of Son of Man be. So it is our duty to go out there and teach the world because they know not what is coming. And, the, and then if we look at Luke, it said... Even thus, it shall be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. It's talking about fire and brimstone. Well, if you look, you're there in 2 Peter, and you're there in verse 1. <clears throat> We're going to read quite a bit of it, but it, I think it's important for this part. It says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds, by the way of remembrance, that ye be mindful of the words which are spoken before by the holy prophets. So we have to be mindful of the, the previous words. Well, one of the prophets was Noah. And of the commandments of the apostles of the Lord's Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of that, of that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now and by the same word are kept in store. Think about that. By the word of God, these things are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we see that repentance, that change of mind. We saw that in Genesis 6. And I actually did that, do that on purpose, but it's good to know that we, when I've done this, I'm not going to re preach it, but we're changing what we believe in to save us, to believe in on the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? And it says there, that the Lord is not willing that he should perish. Now, that the, the fact that he's not willing and he's not just are two different things. He's not willing, but he's got to give you free will. If you reject Jesus Christ, you're, you're damned to hell forever and ever. I mean, that's just, you know, the bottom line. But there in 2 Peter 3.10, we see it says, but the, day, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, just like those floodwaters came. So this is a foreshadowing not only of Jesus uh, Christ, and we see all the pictures of Jesus, but we also see a foreshadowing of the end of the world. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth and also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye 
to be in a holy conversation in godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, where in the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. See, where, what our focus should be when these things happen is, what are we looking towards? What are we looking forward? And the reason I, uh, you know, one of the main reasons that I also preach this is because it, what is your attitude when life strikes at you? Not, not uh, everything is a trial and tribulation as, in a, as they come at you because you preached maybe hard on the sodomites or, you know, this morning, and I don't even have to, it, it's nothing, <clears throat> I'm going to say it because it, it, it was, it, it just happened here, but it's not, I'm not calling anybody out, but I preached on the Freemasons, where we had some older church member, members who, who used to go to Mason Lodge, and I said, you know, Freemasonry is satanic, and this, obviously, this individual didn't know, doesn't, obviously, he didn't get into the higher ranks where they reveal all the occult, and so he's like, well, we pray to God. Well, if you know anything about Freemasonry, is they pray to a creator. And if you get deeper into it, you know that they're actually praying to Satan or Lucifer. But that's a whole other tangent. But what, I guess what I'm trying to say here is, where is our focus? You know, what is it that we're looking forward to? Going back to the, to, 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 uh, the last part of that verse, it says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Look, we're looking forward to that new earth and that new heaven where dwelleth righteousness, meaning we want to be with other righteous individuals. You know, today we went out soul winning and we had the opportunity to lead some people to Christ. They're going to dwell in righteousness with us. We're looking forward to that. You know, that should be our goal. And, and what ends up happening when things like this strike is people worry more about the material things that they're losing or the inconvenience then they worry about the, uh, the task at hand. And, and by the way, the, I'm not the only one who does this. So I'm using the example because this is the example I have. But I know countless of people that are in the battle, the spiritual battle for Christ. And some actually are better at fighting this battle than I am. And, but the thing that I want to point out is, you know, it's been an inconvenience not to have that second car because you get used to the things. And it was an inconvenience to have it flooded and to have to drain it out and to take it to the mechanic. But in all of this, the ministry hasn't stopped. You know, that shouldn't deter you from doing the things that God has asked you to do. These things are going to happen. Just like when you get attacked for the faith, when you get called names or they bring on uh, false, uh, false accusations about you and they call you names and, 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 and they, they say you're a certain type of individual. You have to be focused on what God has said. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> I said it this morning, I'll say it again. Noah was one of eight. And Noah was really like one. Because he, he had to gather his, his wife, sons, and his daughter-in-laws. But he was the one that was instructed. So he was the one that had to lead that charge first. He had seven people that followed him, and then the rest of the world just kind of looked at no and you know, nothing's changed, so we can make, in the Bible, obviously, we can go in it, but I'm not, for the sake of time, the world might have looked, I mean, can you imagine what, how they looked at this guy building this, this ark? And they're like, what are you doing? And in there, there's other safe people, you know, there's other people that believe in the Lord that, that are walking. And, and, and they're watered down Christians. And that's what happens even today. I mean, today we might get to the point where other people say they're saved, and they, they, they are, but they're just not willing to walk that, that tight road. I mean, that tight, uh, that narrow road. They're not willing to stand for the things that you need to stand. They're willing to let the comforts of the world, they're willing to let the idolatries of the world, the, the temptations of the world take over their lives instead of standing for what's right. And that's a scary thing if you think about it, you know, that people can be so uh, uh, disheveled or just thrown, out, thrown for a loop when things like this happen. Look, life is, is tough. Job said you're here about a few days and they're full of trouble. And the last point, of the, that's why it's leading me to the last point. And, and that's why I read that part in Genesis, uh, in Genesis 8. We need to have Noah's attitude when the floods come and everything dries. 
like Noah had immediately after the ark, when he built it an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast in it and offered a burnt offering unto the Lord. In other words, after all of this happened, I mean, think about how he must have felt. I mean, he had maybe acquaintances or people he knew. They were living a long time, 600 years. I mean, these are relationships he's had. He's living in, in, in the world, but he's not of the world. And he knows that when he comes out of the ark, it's him and seven other people. It's over for everybody else. I mean, there is nobody on the earth. They have to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. And too many times, we're not willing to lose that relationship or that friendship or that family member for the cause of Christ. Now, I'm not saying go out. I mean, Noah didn't have to instigate it. God took care of the matter. But Noah was willing to stand on righteousness. Noah was willing to stand on what's right. And so the last point is that we have to be content when the flood waters come or when the fires come or when the challenges come. You know, and, and, and uh, you know, that word content is an interesting word because it, it, uh, it, it means to be, to be held or to hold, right? It literally held or contained within limits, limits, hence quiet, not disturbed, having a mind at peace, easy, satisfied, so as not to repine, object, or oppose. But also, you know, it's the content of certain things, like what's in this content. It, it holds things in. And so the Bible kind of gives us an indication that we have to be content, I meaning we have to hold in those emotions. We have, to, we have to fight the flesh constantly telling us to go against our, our better judgment, right? Because there's times, I mean, my dad did it to me just a couple weeks ago. Uh, I love my dad, and it isn't that, I'm not going to say anything real negative. I'm just My dad's a doctor. He's been a doctor his life. I had a flu. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. I had a, a cold, and immediately he wanted to give me antibiotics, and I said, well, let me, let me just let this thing run its course, and let me see if I can just beat it on my own. And for a couple of days, he, he was really angry at me that I wouldn't take medication, uh, and I heard everything from how can I fight science to, you know, what if you die? You're going to leave your kids and your wife without a father. I mean, he didn't do it on purpose. He's just doing his job. I mean, I know he cares for me. I'm not, I wasn't even angry at him. But it was like this fear mongering of like, look, if you don't do this, you're going to get worse the next time. You're going to really have a serious problem. You could develop pneumonia or bronchitis. And, and I know all these things are true. But the reality is that our bodies are built in such a way that they should be able to heal basic stuff. Like it, it, and the other thing I told him is I, I'm not an idiot. Like, you know, if I start getting worse than what I'm feeling right now, I'm gonna, I'll go to the hospital and I'll check myself in before I put myself in a situation where I'm gonna let myself die. But the reality is that unless you're content, unless you have that ability to look at the Bible and contain those emotions, that fear can kind of creep in. I mean, there was points where I was like, well, you know, especially when it's at night, you know, where all the symptoms kind of uh, uh, come to surface more. You know, you ever kind of make it through the day when you're sick and you work and, and you can kind of suppress it and you're taking like, you know, uh, Advil or ibuprofen and you're taking the, the Alka-Seltzer thing and you drink, you feel a little bit better. And then you go to sleep at night, you're trying to get a good night's sleep and what happens? You end up coughing more and the fever comes. And so my dad just told me that, I mean, I'm putting my, my family at risk and my life and everything. And I got a fever, and I'm, I'm coughing. I'm like, man, maybe I am getting worse. And I, he, I'm starting to get in my own head. I'm like, maybe maybe I should take that medication. I, I, what if I am going to put myself in a... And, I, and, and then you, you realize, God's going to take care of everything. He'll let me know when I need to do these things. But if we not, we're not grounded in the Word of God, those emotions can creep in on anything. You know, when the floods were coming, people were freaking out. And, you know, our neighbors were running around, and everybody was in a panic mode. And I told my wife, look, if we have to, we'll go upstairs. As soon as the water recedes, we're just going to find a place to, we'll have to go either to your mom's house in Dallas or my parents' house, or we'll find a place to move out. We'll, we'll call and get a result. What else are we going to do? I mean, there's nothing. We're, I knew we weren't going to flood. And let's just say that the waters did rise that high and we, we flooded. Well, my wife and I are saved. Her children are young. We know what the Bible says about the age of accountability. That's what we got to do. You say, well, that sounds kind of morbid and, and uh, depressing. No, actually, it sounds kind of exciting to, not know, to know that I don't have to fear that stuff, that I don't have to worry about that, those stupidities, that I just have to focus on the task at hand. And then the next day or the next few days, you just get back on your horse, you, 
you do what you can, you solve the things of the world, and then you get back to the soul winning, you get back to your Bible reading, you get back to the discipleship, you get back to whatever it is that you're doing for the Lord. But let's go ahead and close out. Go to Philippians 4, verse 10, and I'll read for you Luke 6 real quick. And the Bible says in Luke 6, verse 46, it says, And why call ye me Lord, Lord? I apologize, I should have drank before. And Luke 6, 46 says, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my saying, and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house, and diggeth deep, and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, and the stream beat vehemently upon that house, and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth, and doeth not, is like a man that without a, that without a foundation built a house upon the earth and against that which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great and the spiritual application of the floods will come is that our emotions can flood our lives we can be flooded you've ever heard the term you're flooded with the, I had a I was flooded with emotion I was watching this movie and I was flooded with emotion or Somebody was telling me a story, and I was flooded with emotion. And we have to be, what does the Bible say? But look, if it comes, you're going to be what? It says, he is like a man which built his house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. What is that rock? The word of God. And when the flood arose, when those emotions arise, and that stream beat vehemently upon the house, and that fear comes, and then, what does it say? And could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. We have to fight those fight or uh, uh, those fight. Uh, what is it? Fight or flight emotions constantly. You know, people tell tell me all the time. Well, you know, what if you lose your job because uh, or your business because of this? What if I lose it? Or what if they come after you? What if they come after me? I mean, it's not if, it's when. As a matter of fact, I was having a conversation with a brother in Christ that I know in uh, Tennessee, and uh, through text. And, and he's like, hey, I, I've noticed that, you know, you really haven't, haven't gotten attacked for, for your preaching yet. And I said, yeah, not yet. You know, it's, it's only a matter of time, especially because we're willing to put all our information out, uh, you know, on social media and everything. Eventually, that's going to happen. But when it happens, just like Noah, he knew the floods were coming, but he also knew that God had a plan. And we need to know what? That our foundation is on that rock. You know, that rock, which is Jesus Christ. You're there in Philippians 4, verse 10. It says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, in verse 10, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And by the way, I love that quoting that verse if it's quoted in context. You know, the Bible tells us to be content in whatever state we're in. You know, people want to quote that, but they want to neglect that the rock is, their, is Jesus Christ and that the rock is the Word. You can't do all things in Christ if you're not content, if you're flooded with emotion, if you're not grounded on that rock and that firm foundation of Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 6, 3 says, If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to that wholesome word, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself because that's what I do sometimes. Go to You go to Hebrews 13, and I'll read 1 Timothy. Go to Hebrews 13, and I'll read 1 Timothy. I, I apologize for that. <clears throat> 1 Timothy 6, verse 3 says, If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words, where, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Look, a lot of people lost personal possessions in this thing. And, and they got, you know, as a matter of fact, um, 
while we were dealing with the flood, one of the ways that we averted the waters coming into our house, it got into the car, but coming in the house as it was getting close was, I know where the drainage ditches are. There's three of them, and they're you know probably about, uh, I don't know, six feet by four feet, and there's three of them in the neighborhood. And I literally went out and I treaded water and I went to each one for about three hours and I just created a routine and I kept cleaning them out, draining, you know, removing all the, and the one that was closest to the, the main street, there was a young lady already cleaning out her car and she was on the phone and I could hear her talking to whoever and she was real front, she's like, I can't believe this happened, I'm so mad, you know, this is just such an inconvenience. And, and the, I know why she was mad because she was worried about losing her car because it was a material thing that she puts her hope on, her faith, her her life. You know, people go and buy nice cars so other people can see you. Look, we can look at the opposites here. In First Timothy 6, 3 says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ into the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting after questions. So we could just take this and just add the opposite. If you, because at the end it says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. So if he is proud, we should be humble. Knowing nothing, God wants us to know something in the word of God. But doting about questions and strifes of words, the Bible says, you know, we should keep silent. Uh, you know, we should uh, tame our tongues, right? And we should know how to give a, our, 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 uh, our speech should be uh, with mercy and, and salty. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to get him. We'll go to that. I'll, I'll go to the verse. It says, but doting about questions and stripes of words, whereof cometh envy. Look, we should be jealous of certain things, like a godly jealousy, but we shouldn't be envious of anybody. Strive. We're in a spiritual battle because we're saved by grace, but we don't go pick the battles. Railings. You know, you shouldn't bring a false accusation on anybody. Evil surmisings. Perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds. You know, what it does is it corrupts the mind. And destitute of the truth. That means that they don't have the truth. It's a desert of, of lies. Supposing that gain is godliness, from such, what? Withdraw thyself. Look, even the way we deal with the, the world, the, the things of the world, we should withdraw ourselves and deal with it the way God wants us to deal with it. Even if the world doesn't understand why you do the things that you do. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Man, it's interesting to even say money in your bank account or the two cars that I had parked in my garage or all the stuff that got damaged that was outside. It just says, as long as you have food and raiment. So as long as I have the clothes on my back and some food, God's going to provide. You know, we could, that's a, I'm not going to get off on attention, but we see that here. Go to Hebrews 13. Go to Hebrews 13. And we're going to we're going to be there in verse 1. Hebrews 13. <clears throat> Go to Hebrews 13 verse 1 it says, "Let brotherly love continue." Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Look, we shouldn't fear what nature can do to us, because God's already told us the end of the story. We're not, the, the world's not going to get destroyed until God decides to destroy the world. And there are certain things that have to come. But we also shouldn't let the flood of our emotions take heed, because the Bible says that, He's not going to leave us nor forsake, the, forsake us, and that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So I guess the point of the, the, the message is the floods will come. The challenges will come. 
And, and right now I'm actually talking about a literal flood. Literal uh, natural disasters will come. We, we can't avoid them, but we can't let them stop us from doing the main thing. Look, the devil has many tools to attack. And God gives the devil a lot of power in this, in this world. And then on top of that, he has a lot of recruits. And there's a lot of encumbrances. There's a lot of roadblocks and stumbling blocks along the way. But we cannot allow these things to hold us back. And one of the things that keeps you from <coughs> being strong in the ministry, from keeping your zeal, from not fainting, from doing the good, from soul winning, is to be content in whatever state you're in. And I know this is more of a topical sermon, more of, you know, uh, trying to get uh, you pumped up, but we need that sometimes. Uh, and I think here in the city, we need that for the last couple of years. I mean, really, people, uh, they put all their, their faith, they put all their time, their effort, their hopes into a house only to have it flood the next year. And they invested all this money and they just see all this money go down the drain and they see their hopes and dreams diminish and, and disappear in front of them. And then they get into states of depression, maybe even get to the point of suicide, maybe get to the point of just not withdrawing themselves from the world, but for the wrong reasons. The Bible says, look, you withdraw from these individuals, but only so that you can be content in what I'm providing so that you can continue to do what you need to do. And, and no point in, in this sermon and in the scripture that I read, God said to stop doing the work of the Lord. He just said, these things are going to occur. I will not leave thee nor forsake, her, forsake thee. I will be with you. You just got to be content in the things you are. And I guess I, I should have said the floods will come. Therefore, be content in whatever state you're in. You know, we could add to that, the title of that sermon. But when the floods come, and they will come, whether they're, they're literal, whether there's rain and it, makes this, and it destroys all your material things, or whether they're emotional and it destroys the emotional stuff, we have to be content in what God's provided in our lives. Look, if, you're, if I'm here right now and I have the energy and I have the ability to preach the word of God, then I should do it. Whether I'm preaching it to a thousand people or I'm just preaching it to my kids at home. If the ability, if God has given me food and raiment, it should not be an excuse for not doing the things of God. And so, I mean, that's, uh, that was, the, I guess, the main purpose of this sermon was to leave you with a, a word of encouragement that we can overcome, but the reason we can is because God already has overcome the world. And greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, just preach your word. And thank you that, uh, you know, you, you, you just give me so much more all the time. Every time I read the word, so much more. And sometimes, like, even uh, today, as I was preaching this, this sermon, you have—I I feel like maybe I didn't do it justice because you—you've you've got so many thoughts, or you've given me so many thoughts running through my mind. I mean, I could—I'm just thinking of Genesis six, seven, eight, nine. Just so many things that we can extract from from those verses. You know, all the good that came out of it, all the bad that came out of it. How, you know, how quickly uh, Noah, you know. Uh, burns an offering and it's a sweet savor and then shortly after he has a vineyard he gets comfortable and then bad things happen because he got drunk I mean just this, this is the cycle of life but for us we need to be founded on your rock on your word Lord and, and my encouragement my my prayer is that others would read the word the word of God that others would go out there and uh, continue to soul win because it's a great encouragement to lead others to Christ and to be in that battle and to have the slam uh, doors in your face and to have the attacks because it grounds you more and more every day and makes you realize uh, all of this is fleeting. All of this will be burned up one day. We're looking for a new heaven. We're looking for a new earth where the righteous dwelleth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.